As I said, I'm a Weston hacker. Uh, I just literally onboarded with uh, Rapid7 about a week ago, so it's doing pretty good. And yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of a introduction here. So, uh, sec uh, sec senior security engineer, uh, senior pen tester, uh, researcher. I've, like I said, I've been doing pen testing for about 11 years. Uh, spoke to several, just got accepted. Uh, I'm going to be doing a similar talk to this at Hope. Uh, so, a takedown con also. Um, just got my um, black hat accepted also on ATM hacking. So, that'll be pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, there's a couple other speaking engagements. Like you said, uh, 12 years programming, security engineering. So it's something that, uh, yeah, definitely got a little bit of background. And then I was doing a actual, uh, for DARPA and Department of Homeland Security, actually doing 911 attack mitigation. So they're basically paying me and some people from the University of Houston to develop mitigation strategies for uh, 911 and call center environments against telephone denial service. So that's a pretty awesome project. And that's like I said, this year I've been hacking point of sale systems. Um, hotel keys, uh, pretty much cars, everything. So that's been a very, very busy year. So, And yeah, I'm going to go over uh, ransomware, how to make your system immune to modern ransomware. And it's something where, uh, while I was pulling some malware apart, I actually uh, came across a couple things that I just thought I'd give out as a concept. And it's something that I've actually uh, worked in production for it. So yeah, here's um, the, I'm going to go over the actual tools used, a brief history of malware and ransomware. We're at a security conference, so I won't go too deeply into that. But it's uh, how I came across the malware, it's actually a pretty funny story. Uh, so uh, how I pulled apart the malware, to look at the payloads, the actual droppers, um, how to defend your systems from the droppers and the main payloads. Uh, in the past, people just looked at heuristic data or they've relied on um, very expensive IDSs and IPS systems. So it's something uh, that basically makes your system immune to the current versions of the malware. So. Yeah, so here's a, basically I had a special Windows 7 environment. It's a tackled VM, so it doesn't know that it's a virtual machine. It thinks it's a physical machine, and anything that's installed on it also believes that. So it also included IDA Pro, some unpacking software, and injectors. And if you guys want any more of the technical details, uh, I can go into that a little bit later. And uh, yeah, just stop by our booth, and I'll definitely talk to you about it. So um, tested on uh, which ransomwares did I test out. So there was the new custom variants of SamSam. -Sam. That was in 2016. I went back, uh, did about seven variants of CryptoLocker, Eight, eight variants of Crypto Wall. I did two variants of uh, Locky, and then I did a couple of the older versions of Crypto Wall. So, and it, uh, what basically I'm going to go over what caused the malware to start evolving because this is the actual weakness in the malware that we're uh, actually taking advantage of. So, so the, some of the next generation security wall features I can't. Uh, there's there's tons of them out there, but they actually have uh, advanced feature sets where they'll actually spin up a virtual machine and actually. Uh, install the software, see what it's calling upon, things like that. So it's actually in a security environment, it's looking to see if it's something malicious. And that's something that the actual malware designers have started putting features in there for detecting virtual machines. Uh, things, things of that nature, some of them have very uh, dis distinct signatures. So it's something where the actual malware manufacturers are actually uh, putting that into their actual droppers. So, and that's uh, one of the ways that, uh, for example, uh, all three of the computers on the left were infected because they were physical machines. They had uh, some of the things uh, true that weren't true. So, and uh, basically, I got the um, malware last year uh, on New Year's, or uh, sorry, it was actually Christmas. I got the email. I checked it on New Year's, but uh, yeah, one of my buddies actually he runs a actual disposable uh, mail service. I met him at DefCon 18. He's a very interesting fellow. So, but yeah, I get excited every time he sends me an email because it's usually malware. So. <laughs> and he runs, a, like I was saying, he runs a, a self-destructing service on Tor. So he comes across a lot of custom malware, a lot of the packers, uh, things like that. And uh, I actually sold, a, he sold me this one for a billion ISK. So does anybody play EVE Online or has played EVE Online? It's a, yeah, the currency of the game. So I got it for a pretty good deal. So, <laughs> and uh, there's some, uh, what do call it, in industrial control software that he also sent me. And I'm going to be doing a white paper and some research on it in October here. So, but it's actually looking at uh, well site information and uh, it looks like it, yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting research. So, and uh, yeah, so software as a service, uh, everybody, that was a buzzword two years, three years ago. So, and it's now something that the malware manufacturers are doing for about around $50. You can launch your own uh, uh, campaigns using their actual uh, toolkits and some of their actual web portals. So it's something they actually have technical support. So if anybody has problems procuring uh, bitcoins or things like that, they actually are pretty decent. I never thought there'd be a day where we actually have a, technical support for malware. So that's yeah, pretty interesting. But uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of the toolkits. Um, like the, there's the Angular toolkit. There's some other ones that are actually uh, for sale on the black, on the dark web and the actual black market. And uh, that's a pretty booming industry. They 
Uh, the estimations that I read online are somewhere around, I think it was like $40 million a year. Uh, they're up to like three and a half million a month um, based off of the actual reversing of the actual Bitcoins and the actual crypto ransoms. So, or the actual ransoms that have been paid on the crypto locker and some of the other ones. So, yeah, and uh, basically what is a dropper? Um, pretty much everybody here should, should have a little bit of knowledge of it. It's basically the snow plow that comes before the bus. It's something that is uh, quick and actually pulls down the rest of the malware. Um, these signatures on these literally change hourly, I've seen. Uh, I literally wasted the time pulling it apart the second time only to see it was the same program. It just was packed differently or it had a different obfuscation applied to it. So it didn't have the same signature in the antivirus heuristic engines, which are usually six, six hours at the very best behind. So that's something where the malware droppers are actually, uh, they're staying ahead of the actual curve on this kind of stuff. So, and yeah, uh, here's a look at payloads. Um, this was a malware that I came across a couple months ago. It actually ruins a perfectly good Windows 7 installation. So. <laughs> But no, this actual, uh, the malware, what the actual payload is, is what the actual malware does. So it's something that, uh, yeah, that's the payload. And then the dropper is actually the one that pulls the entire ma uh, malware onto the system. So, and yeah, here's uh, what the payload for the actual crypto locker is. It looks for a lot of these kind of file extensions. Um, uh, some of them actually prioritize by size, things like that. Like Sam Sam does a very good job of actually creating a list of what it's going to encrypt first because it knows it's going to get caught you know, 40, 50% through. Uh, it's assuming it will by some kind of IDS or actual uh, certain portions when it starts spinning up some of the program. So, uh, but the actual droppers, they, uh, yeah, here's uh, some of the advanced uh, heuristic method, or the methods that they're doing for as far as obfuscating the code. Um, this one's kind of a joke, but it's, uh, yeah, they're using the exact same features that people are uh, using on the wild. So it's something where, yeah, like actual software companies, they're using pretty much the exact same professionally tailored um, anti, or, um, anti piracy and anti um, install solutions. So. Oh uh, yes, uh, so this basically my first concept I'm gonna go over is actually attacking the dropper. And uh, this one was a one that was built into a file extension that is usually emailed to people. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it passed uh, this virus signature. It did uh, pass on virus total. I think there was one, one flag on virus total, but that uh, was about two years, or about not two years, two, two hours old. So the actual uh, heuristic engine did not actually detect that. So, so I'm gonna go into the first concept on this. So does everybody have a pretty good understanding of what the actual malware does, how it's pulled onto the system? Everybody here has heard of CryptoLocker, yep, ransomware in general. So uh, the first actual one is called Old Yeller. And uh, basically why this works is um, the dropper, every single one of the droppers I was looking at, they actually kill watchdog programs. So that's something where, uh, yeah, and everybody has seen Old Yeller. It's basically a, it's a good story of a boy and his dog. And uh, well, the antivirus watchdogs are actually the process that restarts the antivirus if the antivirus is killed. So when the actual uh, watchdog is killed, most of the time it's something that it can't restart itself. So I've actually created a process that is basically a fake antivirus watchdog. I attacked it to an intentional, intentional kernel panic you can do uh, in the registry. And basically when the watchdog uh, is Kill, or when the actual watchdog process is killed, it'll actually intentionally uh, blue screen the computer. So you've uh, effectively stopped malware from being pulled down on your network. And this is actually attacking the, uh, or the actual dropper. It's not actually looking for any signature information. This is if it's already gotten past your antivirus and some of your other uh, data. So and this will intentionally blue screen. And if you have that user that will go back through, boot their computer back up, you can actually uh, have the actual crash log copy over the hibernation file and it'll actually uh, uh, soft brick the computer so you have to actually pull it into IT because I've seen where people will literally uh, after they got infected once they'll go back into the email because it didn't work correctly so <laughs> but yeah the software method two is Keats uh, Keats was my cat when I was growing up so that's why I uh, named it after him in honor of him and it's a uh, basically a program uh, like I was saying a lot of those systems are looking for sa uh, sandbox environments and they'll actually stop themselves so what I did was take uh, took apart the malware I came across uh, several of the methods that it was looking for. Um, it was looking for like machines that had over two gigs of RAM. It would automatically uh, go into hibernation mode if it wasn't uh, over two gigs of RAM. So there's uh, registries, uh, parts of, uh, there's actually a hex you can change inside your operating system to make like even like a 32 gigabyte system like this look like it has two gigs of RAM. So that was one of the very, very simple first methods that I came up with and I did uh, get it working. It worked on about 70% of the malware out there that I was testing. So there are certain registries and flags and. There was also, I added a false debugger presence. So I made it look like there was a debugger installed. So, and that was one of the things where I was able to stop uh, literally 70% of the malware that I was looking at earlier. So, and here's software method two. It's uh, called Emo, and it basically gets malware to kill itself. So it's a pretty decent, not only, 
the full version of the malware, it makes it, basically makes it kill itself. It uh, lowers your RAM down to 1.5 gigabytes, and that's, uh, you can actually physically use your entirety of your RAM. It installs uh, fake VMware tools. It also installs fake debuggers. And then there are five sandbox environments that it uh, adds registry keys, stuff like that, to make it look like it's a fully virtualized uh, environment that the malware does not want to unpack itself into. So that's something we're uh, making these changes to the registry. It literally killed 100%. I wish I could say 99.9. .9. I wish there would have been one that would have, uh, you know, gave me a little bit of a fight on it. And it literally, uh, every single one of them thought they were being di dissected and it actually protected the computer. And uh, this had no impact for as far as the testing that I did for in a, as far as in a production environment. So, and yeah, we'll be uh, releasing these tools in August. And uh, these, some of these are very, very simple. As far as uh, if anybody has access to a hex editor, you can do one of the first methods that I was speaking about. So as far as changing your actual RAM, so. And uh, here's the hardware method. Who's ever seen those really good deals on eBay, like for a 256 gigabyte SD card for like $8? Yeah, they're not really that. It's uh, actually an eight gigabyte with, uh, yeah, with a copyright infringement to logoing and all that jazz. Uh, but basically what it does is it has a hack table of content on it. So you can actually, uh, it looks like you can load 256 gigabytes of information on it, but it actually starts copying over itself and it just holds the TOC contents uh, of the actual card. So this is one of the methods when I actually started generating fake MP3s, fake MP4s, JPEGs, things like that. Uh, I started out with very, very small files. And uh, once you fill the 256 gigabyte uh, disk with actual fake files, you can just uh, ghost it over, you can just clone it over and make other ones to run on other computers. So basically, yeah, I procured it on eBay. <laughs> it was 14, it was too good to be true. So that was something that, uh, yeah, and then over on the left here is verifying the data. It does not verify. Uh, it basically copies onto the actual SD card, then it checks the integrity of the files. So that's something that this is definitely a hacked card. And since it's an actual hacked USB card, you can load your own uh, uh, files on it and you can randomly generate them in those file extensions that I was looking at earlier. So if you fill it with random JPEGs, MP4s, things like that, it's actually going to be uh, a pretty cool process here. So. Uh, this takes advantage uh, of the parse order of the actual ransomware. So once you put this SD card in your machine, you give it the A letter drive. Um, for the most part, with the exception of Sam Sam, there was a, every single one of them went through your A drive first, B drive, C drive, D drive, then it went on your online drives or your uh, shared drives and stuff like that. So that's something where if you th uh, so throw this SD card inside your uh, system and you mount it, uh, just give it your A, A drive, it'll actually, uh, yeah, it, you can actually go above and beyond that with uh, some of the 16 gigabyte ones. So if you literally fill this card with random data, it's going to tie the malware up. I tied uh, one of the malwares up for 18 hours one time. It was on a pretty powerful machine. But on your average workstation, uh, when it's searching out some of these, it'll actually find the smallest ones first. It'll start encrypting them. Uh, so that gives you a lot of time for your actual uh, an antivirus engine to get updated. And also it ties the malware up uh, pretty hef heftily. And then also, it also blue screens your computer when it's about 30% done because uh, it literally uh, takes 1.3% of your CPU utilization um, each cycle that it does. So that's something where about, like I said, about 33% through that card. Um, and that's what I'm saying with uh, Sam Sam, even the more, the more, some of the more advanced custom tailored ones, it'll actually lock the operating system up. So you've just stopped your user from getting infected just by having a hacked USB plugged into their system. So there's no software you need to run or anything. So. And yeah, hiding your files. So basically, uh, there's also um, the backup systems. The new version of Locky actually deletes some of your uh, uh, backup files. So that's something where, uh, or even your shadow folder, system folder, stuff like that. So uh, you can actually delete. Uh, you can use a shift disk utility. So you can basically um, shift some of your backups um, positions and stuff like that. And it'll actually put them in systems folders. Um, Three out of the five malwares we were looking at earlier don't check into systems folders. They don't want to lock up your operating system, which is basically what I was doing. So it's something where they try to stay away from the actual systems files and they stick to those file extensions they know. They don't want to start actually interacting with uh, systems files. So that's something where, um, that's a very, very simple one. You can uh, move some of the shadow copies or you can actually delete your shadow copies. And uh, none, like I said, none of the ransomware I came across does like a DOD wipe or a low level format. If it's a solid state drive, it would erase it. So. And the DOD format is just the three level pa or three passes. So, and yeah, here's the Crypto Locker Simulator. This is uh, something I came up with after I <laughs> pulled the uh, first version of it apart. It basically is a, you can run it in your environment. You can see where your open read and writes are. You can see what the actual payloads were. You can uh, see, 
see if your antivirus would have caught some of the more advanced features. And this was the original version of it. I used to give this out as a, like a value add on pen tests. So it's something where, you know, a lot of the, especially in smaller environments, they didn't realize how susceptible they were with some of their open read writes or um, some of their usernames and passwords. Uh, it, there were some simple, so this basically is a zoo form of the original version, or it was actually the second version of Crypto, uh, crypto Locker. So, and this one was just for simulation purposes. So you can actually test uh, some of the call home functionality, which I'll go into here. And this is the actual uh, 2.0 or the framework that I have. And this will also be released in August, and uh, it's all open source, it's free, you can feel free to uh, play with around with it as much as you want. And this testing framework, uh, basically, here's the list of the functions, it calls the uh, uh, posts, so it sends posts, so it tries to call home, it'll test uh, some well-known bad servers to see if your uh, actual firewall is going to catch it. Uh, you can search for open read and writes, uh, you can test your backups uh, against encryption, you can calculate your ransom amounts of what they would have cost you, you can uh, do a bait file. Uh, which is basically uh, some of the information from the malwares that I pulled apart. Uh, there are certain things they'll grab off of your system information to generate the key. So at a later time or even uh, at the current time, you can actually um, pop some of that information into a backup, even if it's a, a I've got it successfully working in up to a three week old backup. So if you generate the, that same functionality into those, uh, some of the changes do lock the operating system up. So that, like I said, it is a low likelihood and I'm still gonna be working on that. But if you actually roll those, uh, key, or those, those features into the actual backup, you're able to re-encrypt at a new, like most of the people that have actually helped pay ransoms, it was stuff where uh, they only need one file or two files. So this is something where you can do your free file and then you can uh, re-encrypt yourself and then actually uh, have it go for the second file. So that's something where, yeah. And uh, as far as Keats and some of the old Yeller functionality in the emo, you can actually uh, lock down some of that functionality. So you can actually control some of that stuff, you can modify it and uh, yeah, you can pull down um, the actual file systems, uh, the time of infection, stuff like that. So, and you can download the, or downgrade the clock time, like I was saying, and you can test your uh, payload avoidance. So that's something where uh, you can actually test the, to see if your virtual machine will be detected by different variants. So that adds functionality that malware researchers can actually put, this one looks for this now, or this now, or this now. So that's something where uh, above and beyond what I'm doing, because I'm not a full-time uh, malware engineer. So it's something where I, uh, I do this a lot of my free time. Like I was saying, the original thing, it took me probably two and a half, two and a half weeks on my free time. So it's something where uh, I think some of the professionals had it torn apart the day and a half later, but they have an entire team. So this is something where you're basically adding a kind of a signature, but it's something that is attacking the actual payloads and the droppers instead of the actual uh, signature and stopping yourself from getting infected. So, and that's something where I'm excited to see uh, uh, some of the feedback first off from uh, some of the people in the community and then also from the actual malware people. Because uh, I did a talk at DEF CON last year and I did a, uh, it actually injected fake credit card numbers into memory, and then I've seen actual, some of the um, more recent, recent versions of the memory scrapers actually combating some of that type of features. So, so it's pretty awesome to see, you know, the actual industry uh, take an effect from it. So I'm excited to see how the actual malware manufacturers, because this literally, uh, like I was saying, stops a majority of the actual malware that's out there. And yeah, and here's the actual look at it, and with that resolution, I always do a blown up version. So like I was saying, you can test uh, your post call home. You can actually test your backups. So there's a file extension if you wanna you know, see if your actual backup process is working, things like that, calculate the ransom. You can check your uh, domain on that uh, to see the likelihood. There's no feedback on the domain check uh, to see if it's actually one that pays uh, or actually gives you the encryption keys when you actually check it. So this is pretty much an entire framework to simulate or emulate in your environment or your customer's environments where they can actually see how they would be affected by uh, some of the more uh, recent ransomware. And then they can also test some of their AV manufacturers uh, to see if they catch a lot of that stuff. So, because these do have a lot of the features of some of the antivirus, so, or of the actual malware itself, so. And yeah, here's one of the other ways I made a, it's a, basically a, there's a couple things I did, an Outlook plugin uh, that is halfway done that uh, basically uh, when a file comes in, and if there's a way to do it in Outlook, I was not able to find it where you can basically save it in the older version before macros are enabled uh, for certain users. So it's something if you have that person that keeps clicking the spear phishing campaigns or if that's the twice, the second time, it's kind of maybe take that privilege away from them. Uh, it's something where it sends a copy to their spam folder. So they do have the original one if they needed to look at it. And you can actually roll internal file extensions because when you install the, the actual program that I have, it's, uh, and this one's with uh, Keats. So once you install Keats, it'll actually grab all the file extensions that uh, CryptoLocker goes for and it'll actually obfuscate them. So it actually, uh, and as you can see, it still associates them, it reassociates them with the actual 
programs. So, and this does actually go into the actual padding on the uh, XML data of the actual files. So that was the next step. If I was a malware manufacturer, I would actually you know, start looking deeper into some of the files. So, but yeah. So yeah, you can basically roll your own internal extensions. Like these used to be JPEGs, and you know that uh, other one is a PowerPoint presentation. So it's something where you can actually have your own custom file extension. So if something comes from the outside, it'll immediately get grabbed by well, one of the swamp files. So and then it'll actually, if you want to have an internal file structure, you could actually uh, roll this internally inside of a. Uh, we were actually talking earlier how hard it would be to actually do this in a larger environment. 75 users, yes, all day long, but uh, what about 20,000 users, stuff like that. And this is where it might be tailored for certain, uh, certain parts or certain divisions of the company. And you can actually have an internal file structure which uh, can change daily. Uh, that's what my, mine actually does, uh, not on this computer, but it actually evolves daily. So it'd be hard to stay on top of what the actual randomly generated uh, uh, file extensions would be. So, and yeah, is there any questions? So. Yes. Um, when you were installing the, the extra tools on there, like the, the debugger, registry values, and, and things like that to kind of emulate uh, it being in a virtual environment or a regular analysis environment, are, are you worried about self-destructive malware ones that when they detect that, rather than just stopping what they're doing, go for the most damage possible and try to bring down the system? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I started looking at right at the end there, because like some of them are the self-destructing malware. And that's why we at, I attack at the dropper level, because that was one of the things, once the malware's, like you're saying, some of them, they will, you know, try, uh, I've even seen ones that go after your IDA Pro key. So, like, it's something where you're, you're getting attacked on, on that basis. So it's something where, yeah, totally, uh, this is, that's why I'm trying to stop it at that level of the actual dropper. And uh, that's, where, yeah, as far as the other, that'd be awesome to check into some of the actual experience with some of that. But yeah, some of the actual payloads for some of that stuff, I haven't looked too much. Do you know which variant? Did some of the more destructive stuff? Um, there, there's one or two variants, CryptoLocker 2.0, that do it. Okay. So some of them just do the use of the shadow, and the rest of them do what you're starting to do for the buggers. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the same thing. Because uh, the original version, the first two versions of CryptoLocker, somebody handed me the the pull full, uh, pulled apart versions and then the rest of them I did myself. But yeah, I didn't look that deeply into some of the destructive payloads of it. So, and yeah, some of those are really, really easy to flag, but if they've already taken down the watchdog and the AV, that's something where, it, yeah, there's nothing left to stop it. So, but yeah, I think as, as far as being put in a series with this, that would definitely stop some of this. And yeah, there's no, there's no way better to block this other than to have proper backups too. And that's a huge problem up in the Midwest where I live, up in North Dakota. So, yeah. so any other questions? Sweet. <laughs> you mentioned uh, pulling apart the ransom uh, the malware and looking at what language do these guys use mostly? Um, well, most of it's compiled in C, but you have to, anytime you reverse engineer anything, you usually have to do it in assembly. So, x86 assembly, and then some of the phone stuff would be based in ARM assembly. So, and yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, you guys have a little bit of a background in programming. It's uh, definitely something once you get into, especially if you're uh, familiar with C, it's pretty simple to, or not simple, but. And nothing's ever simple about assembly, but it's something where you, you can definitely go back into some of the more uh, lower level languages. So, yeah. But yeah, as, as far as that goes, it's all mostly viewed in C. Or in the, there, there are some comments and stuff like you can pull out of uh, some of the higher level stuff. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yes. Uh, I have seen a couple of them. Uh, there's a couple. Oh, the question was has he seen mobile ransomware? And I, I've seen a couple for that were, uh, this was like a year or two ago, I didn't actually get copies of them, but they were going after unlocked uh, Android. I forgot the actual distro or the version of Android, but there has been a couple of them that uh, do premium toll services. They have uh, some of them that run botnets for as far as stuff like that. So, but yeah, as far as the actual, I have, I have caught, caught wind of some of the actual ones that are actual ransom based ones. So for as far as phone systems, I haven't actually looked into the validity of those or got samples of them. So. That'd be definitely something to check into, though. So, yep. So, would this work on a rooted device or a non-rooted device, or both? Like uh, for Android. Oh, for Android, I believe uh, their their specific uh, exploit that they took advantage of was with rooted devices okay. or unpatched devices, and I don't remember the manufacturers or the actual distro, but so. But yeah, that was uh, that was one of the biggest things at DEF CON. It used to be so awesome, you know. What I mean, uh, everybody root your phone, you know, like don't tell us what to put on our phones, and then all of a sudden it's like. We need these security updates, like, please patch them quick, Verizon, you know? <laughs> so it, there's been a total shift in that kind of stuff, and yeah. Yeah, but as far as some of the actual uh, malware, for, as far as I've been looking at a lot of ATM malware, 
uh, recently, and that's been going pretty crazy. I know some uh, gentlemen down at uh, a security conference did a really good talk on that recently, so I'm excited for those videos to come out, but yeah. Like I said, I, I don't pull it apart full time, but this is something where uh, in a couple of environments it worked really, really good, and I'm excited to see how the community plays off of it and some of the feedback, so yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Yep. Like I said, I have a tackled. Uh, I don't know whatever. Uh, there's some other. Like if you actually read some of the like, the, there's very very good. Um, um, like their SANS courses on pulling apart malware. Uh, so there's like very very good research on actually setting up those sandbox environments. And uh, like that's what I'm saying. Some of these triggers, like they'll look for specific you know parts and registry and things like that. So it's something where from that point on, if you want to actually set it up, like uh. Like my one that I, I, I roll is like I take other, some other people's concepts and other people's parts, but as far as that goes, it's uh, yeah, setting it up from scratch and then I just snapshot and revert it. So as far as that goes, and then you have to set up, you have to segregate also some of the network functionality. You don't want it going into your production network. So yeah, I would uh, touch it with a, a very fine grain of salt because it's something where you know, as soon as you start playing around with malware, it's amazingly fun and it's fun seeing it react to such simple uh, processes too. So it's something where yeah, if you want to get into reversing uh, um, malware, perfect ones to start out on are some of the old big name ones. Like uh, my first one I ever did was uh, the Chernobyl or CAH, or C uh, CIH, the Chernobyl virus. It's the one that actually rewrote your BIOS on your computer. So, and some of those really, really old ones are very simple to uh, pull apart with modern uh, debuggers and actual reversing tools. So, so yeah, I would highly recommend that. And it's really, really fun. If, it, if you're looking for a cheap hobby, you know, it's like, it's, it's very cheap, so. <laughs> Just literally got to go click a couple ads and you're getting your own free malware. So, <laughs> yeah. so any other questions? Just Are you looking at anything at the infrastructure level, iOS, vulnerabilities, and that sort of thing? Oh, for as far as, uh, as, far as uh, malware yes. goes, uh, <laughs> I did have a, a fringe. There was a kind of a fringe idea where in, uh, it's actually... Uh, having basically installing a hypervisor and then using class D and class E IP addresses, which uh, every single operating system and tool uh, known to man will drop that kind of traffic. Like I had e even a hard time getting um, uh, Wireshark to even listen to IP addresses that were coming from that range. So that's something where they're, uh, and I've done that over GRE tunnels on DMV or dynamic multipoint VPNs. So like the actual traffic, if anybody tried to sniff it out, like literally as soon as it would get out of its uh, sandbox, we had a WRT, uh, router, so it would actually pass, because it literally, everything is taught with the exception of some very fringe equipment and some broadcast equipment. Everything else will drop the class D and E space. So that's something where, uh, on a network level, that is uh, something we did look at, and that was uh, an oil field pipeline implementation that we were looking at some of that. I don't know whatever happened with the actual process of that. So, But that's on a network level. Uh, you can trick it into, uh, there's certain things where you can call it into black holes, and there are some actual... Uh, tools out there and uh, firewalls uh, and some of the next generation functionality that can actually stop some of the uh, actual processes, like I was saying, um, but some of them will actually let it through. So, and that, those are some of the sandbox. There's oh, five sandbox environments that I looked for what the actual malware was looking for and actually simulated those on a physical machine. And uh, it's literally, uh, some of them aren't supposed to even exist on a window system. Like some of them are calling for window or Linux functionality. So it's something where yeah, this is totally on the actual PC basis of it, or on the actual computer end of it. So, does that answer your question? Okay, awesome. And any other questions? Sweet. How are we doing on time? So, awesome. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your time, guys.